Welcome, everybody, to this Whole Life Action Hour. I'm Ocean Robbins, your host. And today, we are going to talk about your skin, your body's largest organ. It plays a critical role in helping keep you healthy and thriving. It helps you maintain optimal body temperature and hydration levels, it protects you from the sun's ultraviolet radiations, it protects you from harmful toxins, it keeps you in and the rest of the world out. It also gives clues about your inner health. By paying attention to changes in your skin's appearance and texture, you can catch potential health issues early and you can take action to address them. That means taking care of your skin isn't just about looking good. It's about feeling good and living good. So let's celebrate our skin and the incredible things it does for us in this potent action hour with dermatologist, Dr. Apple Bodemer. And let me say, this is a project of Whole Life Club, which is Food Revolution Network's ongoing membership community. Some of the questions I'll be bringing to this interview come from our members. Nothing new here today is medical advice. We're offering coaching and our own best insights. But of course, always consult with a qualified healthcare professional about your specific healthcare realities and needs. Now, Dr. Apple Bodemer is a board certified dermatologist. She's also certified in integrative medicine. Her mission is to educate people to take care of their skin and hair through a healthy diet and lifestyle. She travels through India, or she did travel through India, Nepal, and China when she was a dermatology resident, and that exposed her to new forms of healthcare, new ways of seeing the world, and led her to study and practice integrative medicine as a complement to mainstream Western medical practices. In addition to her clinical practice, Apple shares her message of hope and empowerment as a passionate public speaker and health educator. Apple, welcome. So great to be with you today. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here, Ocean. Fabulous. So let's jump right in here and ask a really big basic question. Why is it important to pay attention to the health of our skin? Well, a lot of the things that you mentioned earlier, it is the biggest organ and it is what keeps kind of our insides in and the outside out. It's also really important because it's how we interact with the world. This is our interface. And whether it's the touch receptors of the nerves that, that support the skin, kind of helping us navigate the world, our temperature receptors helping us know, you know when it's safe. Um, you know, even getting burned is an important indicator about whether or not you've had too much UV radiation exposure. So it really is kind of the house we live in and, and it is the vessel that carries us through this human experience. Yeah, thank you. What is the connection between the foods we eat and drink and the health of our skin? And, and are there specific foods that are especially important or nutrients that are especially important to improve skin health? Yeah, well, as many people might know, we are mostly made up of bacteria in terms of our DNA content. We've got a lot of bacteria that live on us and in us. And our gut plays a really important role in helping regulate overall health, but also the health of the skin. And so what we feed ourselves goes through our gut and it's and feeds that the gut microflora and keeping that really healthy and diverse has widespread effects on, on how your skin is going to function as well. Uh, certainly things like dairy is very, very pro-inflammatory. And mm -hmm. especially if you have issues with any blemish kind of related condition like acne or rosacea or cysts, that can really drive the hormone pathways that lead to those conditions or exacerbate those conditions. Also, sugar, simple carbohydrates, a lot of the processed foods, trans fats, all of those have negative impacts on the skin. And then we can talk about ages or the advanced glycation end products, which come into, we, we kind of bring them in, especially if we're eating charred animal proteins or really well-cooked animal proteins. We get ages also with plant-based foods, but such a much, much, much lower level. Mm -hmm. And those ages, what they do is, is they basically, it's what happens when sugar attaches to our proteins and every enzyme in our body is made up of proteins. And so when these sugars attach, they make these proteins really sluggish. They slow them down so that our body can't do the regulation that it needs to do well. And that can dramatically speed up the aging process, both at a cellular level, but also at an organism level. And what about the foods that are helpful? Are there any that are really um, beneficial in particular foods or nutrients that we should be looking for to optimize the skin health? Yes, yes. And that's, I, I love talking about that, the foods that are optimal for skin health, because a big thing is fiber. 
As I mentioned, we want to feed that gut microflora, microflora well, and that fiber helps keep a healthy balance. Fiber is also super, super important in helping us get rid of old used up hormones that no, don't need to be around anymore. So that's a big thing. And we get fiber from things like legumes and we get fiber from things like greens. All the fruits and vegetables are really rich in fiber. So you get mm-hmm. that, but also you get the other antioxidants are really important. Vitamin C is essential for building collagen. And so we really need to have enough vitamin C. So things like citrus fruits, tomatoes, peppers, all of those things that are really high in vitamin C. And then the antioxidants that I mentioned, there's tons and tons of fruits and vegetables that are really packed with antioxidants. And so the more antioxidant rich your diet is going to be, the better able you are to kind of offset some of the insults that we experience on a day-to-day basis, whether it's from the sun, too much of it, or whether it's from environmental toxins that, you know, no matter how perfect we try to be about avoiding them, they just seep in, especially given the state of our food supply these days. So, you know, anything that's really colorful, naturally colorful, Mm -hmm. and high in antioxidants, high in, in fiber, and, you know, all of the really great things that come with those foods. So it's kind of like there are certain foods that are pro-oxidating or that deliver free mm-hmm. radicals and those tend to age us faster yes. and rob us of collagen and do damage to our cells. Um, mm-hmm. And then there are certain other foods that actually do the opposite. They're antioxidants and they neutralize free radicals and they help us to create more collagen and feel better and look younger. And the interesting thing is you kind of get a double whammy when you replace something bad with something good. Yeah. then you're not just neutralizing the bad stuff. You're actually creating benefit. Yes, um, and I love thinking about that that way. Yeah. It's not yeah. just about, you know, it's not it's not just an equal like, oh, well, I'll just take these things away. We have to replace what we're eating with something. And so if we can replace it with something that's going to pack a nutrient punch and kind of an antioxidant punch, then we're double, you know, we're kind of double ahead of that game. Got it. So let's talk a little bit about the integumentary system, which is mm-hmm. includes our hair and our skin. Um, mm-hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about how these are connected? And let, let's just talk about hair for a minute. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, hair, it's an interesting topic. Hair is basically a dead structure once it leaves the surface of our scalp. So all of this, it's really, in many ways, not essential for human life. Um, Hair does play a really important role in thermal regulation. You mentioned that earlier that our skin plays an important role there. Well, our hair is is really important for that too. And when we don't have hair on top, we lose a lot of heat that way. But, you know, hair is more than just this kind of physical dead structure hanging around. It really is a defining characteristic for many people in terms of how we present to the world. Um, You know, a lot of people, identity gets wrapped up in hair. In some cultures, hair is a very spiritual thing. You know, we, we see hair in some Sikh communities gets wrapped up and put in different places on the head, depending on your gender or your status in the community. Um, in the Buddhist tradition, hair is seen as kind of an attachment to the material world and it's shaved off. So the monks often have really like shaved heads or very closely shorn hair hairstyles. So I think hair is very fascinating from kind of that psycho-spiritual standpoint as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And so would you say that hair thinning and hair color changes are the are these fundamentally genetic is there any relationship between diet and lifestyle choices and the amount of hair and the color of the hair on our heads yes and so it's very complicated because the genetics around hair loss are very complex we used to kind of think like oh if your dad's bald as if you're a man you might be bald if your mom's thin as a woman you might be thin but it goes all over the place and there's you know a really beautiful scatter plot of all the genes that are involved in hair growth and as you can imagine because this is a very metabolically active part of our body it's constantly turning over and constantly regenerating itself yeah. uh, it really is susceptible to what we're doing to our body and even things you know, we talk about stress and in our culture, we think of stress as kind of this bad thing. And if I'm if I'm a good enough person, then I don't experience stress. And that's absolutely not true. We all experience stress at a physiologic level all the time. Mm-hmm. And when the physiologic stress gets to be too much, because this is not necessary, the body will shut it down and it will be one of the first things. It kind of says, okay, you're in a chronic stress state. We need to really focus on other things. 
we're just going to put the hair on pause. You know, so we see a lot of hair loss come from this telogen effluvium. It's just this massive shedding that can happen. And just about any type of stress can trigger that. There's also a variety of other types of hair loss, including autoimmune related types of hair loss. And then the genetic pattern really is hormonally driven and it's very complicated. It's not just the androgens, although the term is androgenetic hair loss. That's what we use kind of in the medical world, but we now know that estrogen plays a role too. And, um, and as I mentioned before, we want fiber because we want to get rid of those old used up hormones that we don't need anymore. That, um, you know, that's one of the big things. So when I'm talking with patients about hair loss, especially kind of the genetic pattern types of hair loss, it really is. We really want to make sure that you're getting plenty of fiber. We're really wanting to make sure that we're cutting out the sugar and cutting mm -hmm. out the charred animal proteins to decrease those ages um, because those advanced glycation end products can affect the hair formulation as or formation as well. Got it. So are there actual studies that have shown that people who consume more fiber, for example, actually had more or thicker hair? Has that been done? Yeah, we haven't seen those kind of medical studies done. You know, they've cost uh -huh. quite a bit of money and in our yeah. environment these days, the big studies that get done are, are funded by pharmaceutical companies. So unfortunately, in the nutritional and uh, lifestyle world, we don't see the kind of robust mm. huge numbers of, of studies that we see. So when I'm kind of looking at the data and making decisions about how to talk to patients or friends about you know, different conditions, I'm kind of going back to the pathophysiology. Like, what do we know about the hormone pathways? Because we still have a fair amount of basic science data that looks at these specific hormone pathways. And what do we know about how do other things interact with these specific pathways, whether it's whether it's hormone pathways or inflammatory pathways? So we kind of have to take it back and look at at, and extrapolate, but we really don't have saying, you know, oh yeah, if you eat a plant-based diet, you're going to have thicker hair because there's a lot of individual variation in hair. So it's a really hard thing to measure as well. Yeah. Right. But I have heard stories and I've seen patients that, you know, and, and these are the miraculous ones. It's not everybody, but that went plant-based and all of a sudden their gray just started disappearing, you know, and I can't explain that. I don't know, you know, how that's happening or mm -hmm. why. But, um, but there are some cases out there. And like I said, it's something that is really cool to see, but it's not everybody. And I would say for most people, once we've got the graying happening, it's, it is pretty hard to reverse that. Um, mm -hmm. We can kind of try to stave that off by living a really healthy lifestyle and diet's a part of it. You know, stress and sleep yeah. also play a big role in how we respond yeah. and age as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, in 2018, you shaved your head for three months. Can you tell us why you did that and, and what did it teach you? Gosh, yeah, that was, it was done as a social experiment inspired by some of my patients who have alopecia universalis. So this is an autoimmune related condition where the body starts attacking the hair follicle at a specific level. It doesn't lead to scarring. Most people are otherwise really relatively healthy. They might have like thyroid issues can come up in some patients, but these are people that walk through the world without hair and especially as a young person. So these were two teenage patients that really inspired me to do this. They're constantly getting asked about whether they have cancer. Their parents are constantly being asked. They're getting condolences and things like that. And so, you know, it's a really uh, difficult thing to kind of walk through life with. And I thought, you know, more people should know about this. And, um, and I was at a point in my life where I was like, I've, had my hair all different colors when my kids were young. We dyed the green, blue, you know, all kinds of fun stuff, but I'd never shaved my head. And, and I thought, you know, if I'm going to shave my head, then I want to do it in a useful way that can bring awareness and educate other people about hair health and hair loss. So that was my intention with, with doing it. And I learned so much about it. First of all, I learned how much heat this hair really holds in um, you know, because I was constantly cold and going like the movies, the grocery store where they keep everything so really cold were excruciatingly painful in mm -hmm. the beginning for sure. And, uh, and so that was a big eye opener. Sometimes I'd roll over in bed and wake up because my pillow was just so hot and I wasn't mm -hmm. used to feeling that. So, you know, a friend of mine runs a nursing home because of that experience and, and, what I shared with her, she makes sure that all of her elderly patients always have hats on in the winter, which really warms oh, wow. them. Yes. Wow. Um, but probably the biggest lesson I learned from that really was about privilege. And, you know, I have been blessed with a head full of hair that is socially accepted as beautiful. I don't have to do anything to it. I go to bed with it wet. I wake up with it 
dry. I run my fingers through it and I'm off to the races. If it's getting in my way, I throw it in a ponytail. And, you know, that I sort of knew I was lucky, but I didn't really appreciate what a privilege it was to have the kind of hair that I have. It also taught me about what it means to have privilege. And I think a lot of it, when we're talking about privilege, whether it's the color of our skin, whether it's our gender, whether it's our socioeconomic class or some other form of privilege, it's such a hard thing to talk about because those of us who have it don't know it. And those of us who don't have it are excruciatingly aware of not having it all the time. And I, I've grown up, I've got a lot of privilege in my life and I'm surrounded by people who have a fair amount of privilege. And I'll say, I've got areas of my life that have been really a struggle and places where I've had to work hard to kind of reverse some things. But overall, I, I'd say I live in a very privileged, um, I have a very privileged ex experience. But some of my colleagues, you know, especially when I was going through medical school, while there was kind of gender equality, it was a very different experience for me as a woman going through than some of my male colleagues as medical students. You know, people would often say, oh, she just got good grades because because she's cute or because, mm -hmm. the, you know, the attending doctor liked her. And they never said that about my male colleagues. And any time this idea of privilege would get brought up, they get super, super defensive. And mm -hmm. I think it's because they just couldn't see it. They couldn't see how they were uh, privileged in their lives. And so that's made me really aware of of trying to kind of shine a light on where I do have privilege. And instead of sort of feeling bad about it, really using that to bring to lift up other people and to mm -hmm. share that with people who may not have as much privilege as I have in certain areas. So mm -hmm. that was kind of the psychosocial, um, you know, spiritual part of it for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I sort of, and it's interesting, monks do that practice by choice. Yeah. And there's something about like stripping away whatever the hair gives of ego or persona or presentation or, you know, it's just sometimes associated with beauty and just having that clean presence that's beneath all that. And you, you voluntarily chose that and also learned something. And now you're helping people, some of whom may not have hair and you're, you understand them differently, what that's yeah. like. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Thank you. Uh, let's talk a little bit about hydration. Um, is Ooh. water, is hydration important for skin and hair health? And if so, are all forms of hydration equal? If it's liquid, is it good? Or are some beverages better than others? Yeah, that's another one of my favorite topics because we really don't give much attention to hydration, at least in traditional medicine. Um, there are very few studies, and I was really shocked when I tried to dig into the literature and really see what was out there. The studies do show that the better hydrated you are systemically, the the better the tiny little blood vessels close to the skin are functioning. And that's kind of as, as good as it gets in terms of the scientific literature. But definitely, it makes sense. You know, if you look at if you're well hydrated, sort of I think of a river that's full and overflowing, mm -hmm. it can feed the tributaries. But mm -hmm. when you're dehydrated, you're just kind of shrinking down and, right. um, and you're not able to kind of push that beautiful hydration out to the skin and to the hair. So certainly dehydration, um, you know, when we think about the skin, it's kind of this brick and mortar where we mm -hmm. have these nice spaces between the cells that are filled with lipid and other compounds that help kind of the cells communicate with, with each other. And, you know, when the cells start to shrink, I can't shrink my fingers, but we get bigger spaces between the cells. And so that leads to further evaporation from the skin and it allows irritants and allergens to, and microbes to get in. So mm -hmm. that's an important part of it. Most of the hydration in our skin comes directly from our systemic uh, circulation. So a lot of yeah. we're putting moisturizers on, people put all kinds of creams and lotions and moisturizers, and we think we're moisturizing the skin. And that's not really what's going on. What's going on is for the most part, we're locking moisture into the skin. There mm -hmm. are a few ingredients that can actually help draw moisture from the circulation and to, to the skin. But if we're not also using what we call occlusives kind of in the, in the medical world is to, to lock that moisture in, it is just going to evaporate. So it's, it's really, really important for skin health. And it's something that, you know, is a constant upkeep. You know, it's sort of one of these things that, yeah, you can be really well hydrated one day and you can get really dehydrated within a day and your skin mm -hmm. will start to feel it'll lack, it'll be a little lackluster. It's going to lose its shine. It's going to lose its plumpness, you know, and all of that. And the same with the hair, because this is dead, once it leaves our head, 
there are cuticles, so these little like fish scales along each and every single strand of hair. And things will open them up, things like a hot shower Mm -hmm. and um, things that we do. And if we just take a hot shower and hop right out and start doing things like blow drying our hair or curling our hair or straightening it or whatever we're doing, that's really can damage the hair and lead to even Mm. more dryness within the hair. So when we're thinking about how we hydrate the hair, we really, because there's no blood vessels that supply this, we can hydrate the cells that grow hair. But at this point, then we're thinking of what can I, how do I treat my hair? What kinds of of products Mm -hmm. and chemicals am I using on my hair? What kinds of uh, physical experiences am I putting my hair through? And and how can I offset that? Got it. So what what should you do after a shower? Just let it dry naturally? Yeah, drying naturally is really a good thing to place to start. The other thing, if you can tolerate a cold finish to your shower, that's good for a lot of other things. And, you know, I, I have a 15 year old son who does this every single shower and I sometimes can do it, but it is hard, especially in a cold winter. In Wisconsin, uh, yes. <laughs> but, but if you can finish off with a, with a cold, like that's going to help shrink those cuticles down again and seal mm-hmm. that moisture into the hair before you even get out and start dealing with any kind of you know, procedures or products. The other thing, we're coming into summer and at least here people love to go swimming and they always have those signs that say, please take a shower before you get in the pool, right? And I have always blown past that because I do not want to get in a cold shower and then have to walk all the way through wherever it is to get to the pool. So, but when I learned about what actually is happening with the hair, then I'm much more inclined to do that because basically what we're doing is we're getting the hair wet. It's absorbing all kinds of fresh, clean water Mm-hmm. So when we hop in the chlorinated pool, it's like a sponge. So if you start with a dry sponge and put it in a in a bucket, it's going to absorb all the water in that bucket. And when you mm-hmm. squeeze that, like let's say you put red dye in it, when you squeeze that sponge mm-hmm. out, it's going to be bright red water. Whereas mm-hmm. if you dunk it first in clear water and then put it in that bucket of red water, when you mm-hmm. pull it out, you squeeze it out, it's going to just be kind of pink. So you're basically like mm-hmm. diluting that chemical, which can really dry out the hair and make it brittle mm-hmm. and prone to breakage and all mm-hmm. that sort of thing. So so the, the showering before exposure to chlorine is pretty important from a hair health standpoint. Fascinating. Okay, so um, what about, uh, some people say that our pores on our skin open when they're warm and close when they're cold. Mm-hmm. So is this another reason to say, for example, finish after a hot shower with a cold shower? Is that healthy for skin as well as hair? Probably yes. And again, what we we don't have any studies specifically looking at that. Um, mm-hmm. And you're not going to totally close off those pores. So every pore is attached to a hair follicle, whether or not we have terminal hairs growing out of that or not. And when I say terminal hairs, that this is a terminal hair. We have mm-hmm. vellus hairs on the other parts of our body where it's a little finer and not mm-hmm. quite as noticeable. But Yes, that can help. Um, And it also helps shut down those little blood vessels. So when you're in a hot, steamy shower, it feels good. But what we're doing is we're dilating all those tiny little blood vessels that feed the skin and causing blood to pump through, which means we're delivering moisture to the skin and then it's evaporating right off. So when we get out of the shower, we're drying ourselves off. We're worse off than when we started, even though it feels like a nice steamy shower. So what the Uh cold water can do is can kind of help shut down those tiny little feeder blood vessels, slow Mm -hmm. that blood flow down. It doesn't stop it obviously completely, Mm -hmm. but if we slow it down a little bit, we're going to be, have an easier time locking that moisture in because it gives us a little bit more time before we end up with that kind of evaporation happening. Got it. Thank you. We've got lots of questions from our whole life club members. So let's see how many we can get to here. Sierra said, what specifically will help postmenopausal thinning and creepy skin? I have it on my arms and legs. Yeah. And that's something that's really difficult because hormones change in menopause and there's not really any way around it. In Western medicine, we don't have great ways of evaluating the hormone shifts because, you know, estrogens, we think of estrogen as one thing, but it's really a variety of of molecules in our body. And the same thing with progesterones, they're very complex. So, you know, and that's one of the reasons why some people consider estrogen replacement therapy. Now I'm not recommending that because it really is a specific conversation with you and your doctor. There's issues related to heart disease risk and you know all kinds of other things that go into it. But the crepey skin, once it's there, the best that we can do is really try to protect it from the sun. So practicing good skin um, UV protection practices, um, moisturizing, so hydration plays a role, and then using really good quality moisturizers on the skin to help lock whatever moisture we have in and and so that we're not going through more and more evaporation because the dryness is really just going to 
exacerbate that. Um, collagen just breaks down over time and there's not really a way we can completely stop that at this point. Now I know that there are people working hard on that and maybe in the next 20 years or maybe sooner we'll, we'll have that, but certain things like, as I mentioned that advanced glycation end products, if you're eating a lot of those, that's going to really rapidly, um, accelerate the aging process. So one of the things that I didn't mention is there's collagen is a protein, um, that's made by our bodies. And it takes a long time for collagen to turn over. So it's not like one day collagen is there and the next day it's a whole new collagen. It takes a long time. And so if we're eating a lot of sugar or these advanced glycation end products, that can stick to the collagen. And that accelerates the breakdown and prevents collagen from connecting with each other. And so it really kind of causes it to shrivel up and, and not function its best. So really focusing on diet, the antioxidants, and trying mm -hmm. to minimize those bad actors from a dietary standpoint may help. And it's not going to take away that crepey skin, but it might help offset it a little bit. Got it. Thank you. Jeanette said, how can white spots on the skin be eliminated? Well, it depends because there's a lot of things that can cause white spots on the skin. So that's kind of a question. It's a good idea to check in with a dermatologist or your primary doctor to see if there's a reason because vitiligo is an autoimmune condition that can cause white spots on specific areas of the skin. Um, there's also some, some yeast infestation. So I don't want to say infections because these are yeast that we naturally have as part yeah. of our skin microflora. But if they get too... Um, comfortable in certain people, then they'll overgrow. And that can cause either white splotches or dark splotches um, on your skin. Uh, and then there's also something called idiopathic guttate hypomelanosis. And that's a mouthful that, that basically what happens is over time, and we tend to see this not so much in young people, but as people hit middle age and older, especially people that spend a lot of time out in the sun, the, some of the pigment producing cells just kind of poop out and they just if they're still there and they're still working, but they're not working as efficiently and effectively as before. And we can end up with these little kind of white spots, usually in sun exposed areas. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you. Um, Diane said, I've been on a whole foods plant-based diet for three years. I am borderline anemic. So my hematologist mm -hmm. put me on a daily dose of 150 milligrams of an iron supplement. Mm -hmm. One of the side effects I've developed is a skin rash on the throat area near the collarbone. Hmm. But I'd like to know is what might be happening inside my body to cause this reaction? Is my immune system being compromised or might my iron supplementation be too high or causing troubles? Yeah, and that's, it's, so iron itself isn't common for causing rashes. You know, if we're getting iron from our diet, we don't see that happen. There are some, whole, some, some food-based iron supplements, and there are several companies now out there that make food-based supplements. And I would strongly encourage you to kind of look at maybe switching over to one of those. Um, they tend to be gentler. And my guess is if it is the iron that's causing the rash, that you may be reacting to one of the fillers in the mm -hmm. iron supplement. Um, and standard iron supplements are usually some form of iron salt, like iron sulfate or or ferrous gluconate. And um, and then they also have these other things that, that, um, that they'll use to kind of fill the capsule with. Um, so that might be something to think about switching to a, a a food-based supplement. Um, and then there are also other things that can cause rashes, especially in this area. You might want to just kind of think about, you could go off of your iron supplement for, I don't know, two to four weeks and just see what happens. If your rash goes away and then comes back, once you start that iron supplement, then it definitely is the iron supplement that's doing that. It might also be a good idea to check your iron levels and make sure that the supplement is doing what we're hoping it's doing and getting you back into that healthy range for iron levels. Mm, thank you. And one other tip I'll put out is that um, iron absorption is dramatically enhanced when there's vitamin C alongside it. So having, um, if you're e eating an iron rich food, getting a little bit of red pepper is the most vitamin C rich food of all, but also green peppers or obviously citrus is famous for this or kiwi fruits or other iron rich foods. Pairing that can can increase absorption dramatically. We have an article. If you go to foodrevolution.org and type in the word, word iron, you can find out a lot more about this topic. Um, let's see. Georgia said, for 40 years, I've been treating, I've been treated by dermatologists for psoriasis with UVB light salves and ointments with small degree of success. I've chosen to not take all the new drugs that keep coming out. Any natural suggestions? I found certain foods trigger it, but no one has given me a diet to follow. I've mm -hmm. read many books, but no major successes. Natural sun is the big help. 
but I live in Pennsylvania, so winters are not good. Yeah, and that's a tricky one. So one thing, you know, with with diet and psoriasis, it's very complicated. And, you know, a whole foods plant-based diet is really the best for people that have psoriasis, not just because of the psoriasis, but because of all of the comorbidities that go along with it. And what we mean by comorbidities, or what I mean by comorbidities, is that we often see arthritis, we often see diabetes, metabolic syndrome, cardiac disease or coronary artery disease, dementia, all of these things can go along with psoriasis. So when we're thinking about managing the psoriasis, we want to take into account what else is this, you know, the dietary changes that you've made, what are they doing in a positive way for you? Omega-3 supplementation can be useful and the literature is all over the place. And I think the reason the literature is all over the place is because all of the studies look just at omega-3 supplementation. They a dose that they'll do a different dose, a different source. But what none of them really take into a good account is your omega-6 consumption. And right now in the U.S., it's a standard American diet has an omega-6 consumption of like 20 to 1. So omega-6 to omega-3 of like, it's it's really ridiculous and even higher because it's really that, that uh, the, the omega-6 fatty acids are really high in processed foods and things like that. The omega-3, like a healthy range, obviously, not obviously, but but a one to one would be really amazing. Uh, but even a, a four to one would be great, or even a six to one. And for some people, like even getting to ten to one, you might see some mild clinical benefit. But that's you know, so looking at your omega six intake, and then um, you you know taking an omega three supplement. Now there's some really great plant based options, some really great algae options, which we didn't have even ten years ago, or, or they were very difficult to find. I wasn't aware of them ten years ago, so. Mm -hmm. Um, so that might be something that could be helpful. And then a lot of times with psoriasis, if you're already doing everything you can from a dietary standpoint, I would look at stress because we know that stress can exacerbate it. I might look at your sleep quality. Um, and I might think about looking into kind of some other medications. And there's one in particular that I use a lot with my patients called uh, naltrexone. And naltrexone is an opioid blocker. It's been around forever. It's very, very safe. We use it for addiction, but in low dose protocols, it really works in a different way in your body. And I've had a lot of success with that. So it might be helpful to find a provider that is fluent in using low dose naltrexone. Not everybody knows about it because it's an off-label use and it's not approved by the FDA and there are no big studies because nobody's going to pay for it. For them, but but in particular, if you're if you're kind of doing everything right from a lifestyle standpoint, um, there are also some topical botanicals that can be really helpful, uh, including indigo. Um, that's another one. It needs to get compounded by a pharmacist, so you'd want to work with somebody who could prescribe that for you because the indigo that you buy, kind of to dye clothing with, it needs to be ground up super super fine so that it can actually kind of get into the skin and and work as the anti-inflammatory that it. That it, that it is. So those are just a couple suggestions, but definitely talk to your provider, look for an integrative dermatologist. There aren't many of us out there, but I am part of a training program and we have about 70 now. So that's very exciting. Um, the, the Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine is also another place where you might find a provider who has some awareness in these types of treatments. Fascinating. Thank you. Uh, Hope said in your Food Revolution Summit interview, you mentioned using oil as a moisturizer for the face. I was curious which oils are best for that and any other advice you may have for natural plant-based skincare. Yes, I'm getting all to answer all the questions I love to answer. So this is exciting for me. Thank you, guys. Um, I'm very passionate about plant-based oils as skincare. First of all, there's no preservatives. So when you look at the ingredient list, it's one. And now they have a lot of oil blends that are out there and you do want to watch for the oil blends. Some of them have preservatives. Um, some of them don't. Uh, I personally really love kind of as an overall jojoba oil. It has the most similar fatty acid profile to our natural sebum. It's officially not a uh, oil. It's officially kind of a wax ester is what it's called if you look kind of at the chemistry behind it. But it works really well. It can be heavy for some people and too light for others. And I think when it comes to the plant-based oils, there's a lot of differences. There's such uh, in smell and color and feel how it spreads. So if you're somebody who is looking for kind of an anti-aging oil, rosehip seed oil is really, really great for that. Super high in antioxidants. Raspberry seed oil is another one. A general overall moisturizer for somebody with kind of average complexion or average concerns. Uh, almond oil. Um, as I mentioned, jojoba oil, apricot kernel oil is a very, very light oil. It does go rancid fairly quickly. So that's something to consider. Heavier oils, 
avocado oil, coconut oil, shea butter. Those are all great options for maybe aging skin, maybe not so much face, but especially in the winter time in a northern climate where you tend to get really a lot of dryness. So it does depend a little bit. And um, I love, love hemp seed oil. It has what I call a little bit of a dirty hippie smell. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that. So I don't put it on before I go to work in the morning. But when I get home and if it's the middle of winter and I'm going to, I call it marinating myself. So where I'll just spread oil all over myself and put some pajamas on that I don't care about and let myself just kind of sit there for a good 30 minutes. Um, I love to use hemp seed oil for that. It's really got some great antioxidants in it and um, and is very light and tends to absorb very easily. So I would say just go play with it a little bit. Go to the food section at your natural foods, you know, grocery store and and try some things out. Um, and like I said, now there's a lot of higher end upscale oil blends and those are totally fine, but you just want to make sure you kind of look at the ingredient list and that you can pronounce all of the things that they say, because some of them are full of, of preservatives and things like that, which we're trying to avoid with the plant-based yeah. oils for skincare. Fascinating. Thank you. Priscilla said regarding rosacea, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Yep. Rosacea. You got it. Okay. What about skincare? Are there products we should avoid? What do you recommend to use as a daily cleanser? Yeah. So for with rosacea, people tend to have dry flaky skin on one end. And then some people will have kind of papules and pustules and it looks more acne-like and they'll tend to be kind of on the greasier side. So it does depend a bit on where you fall in those two camps. Most people with rosacea will have sensitivity, higher sensitivity to chemicals in, in personal care products. So the food grade oils are really, really great because it kind of minimizes those. I generally recommend looking for products that are meant for people with sensitive skin or formulated for babies because that's going to kind of take out some of the big irritators in the personal care product world. Um, and yeah, you'll just kind of have to play a, a, a play a little bit with it. With cleansers, you want to make sure you're using a cream-based cleanser. So nothing that suds. The sudsing is really just for our benefit to make us feel like we're getting squeaky clean. And actually, squeaky clean is really drying. So we're, we really don't want that. Um, there are some good ones that I really like. I don't know if, can I say product names specifically, sure. brand yep. names? Okay. Yep. Yeah, there's one of my current favorites is, uh, that is called Mad Hippie. And I think you can find that online. They have a couple of cleansers, but they have a honey-based gel cleanser that I think is amazing, mainly for people with dry skin. My teenage son, who's kind of struggling with his acne, he doesn't like it. It's a little too heavy for him, but I really like that one in particular. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of the standards that you can find at the grocery store, they may have an ingredient list that's a little longer than we would ideally like, but but Vanna Cream is a, is a product line that's meant for people with chemical sensitivities. And then kind of going back to those oils that I love so much, you can use the oils to cleanse your skin. And so a lot of times, and it will take off even waterproof makeup. So a couple of drops, three, four drops of a, of a plant-based oil, rub it in, kind of get that dirt off. They have now these, these, um, uh, these wipes, the makeup remover pads that you don't even have to have any, you just get them wet and you can wipe that oil off and then splash your face with some warm water and another couple of drops of oil to moisturize and you're good. So you don't need something super fancy and you can actually use the same oil that you use to moisturize as a cleanser. Got it. Thank you. And I will say we had a lot of questions about rosacea. So we've glad, glad we've covered yeah. that. Um, uh, let's see. Um, Marita. Say one I... more thing about rosacea, oh yeah, you're sure. Please. I was gonna say, if you're going to invest in a skincare product, the highest end skincare product in your bathroom should be uh, in your bathroom cabinet should be your sunscreen. So really making sure you're using a very high quality mineral-based sunscreen because the chemical sunscreens, there's all kinds of problems with them and they tend to cause sensitivity. So especially if you have rosacea, you want something that has either zinc oxide, titanium ox dioxide, or iron oxide in it. And there are lots of good options. You'll have to play around a little bit with what works best for you, but mm -hmm. um, but that's going to be the most important because we know that UV radiation can actually start rosacea and it can keep it going, can cause flares. So, uh huh, got it. Thank you. Um, let's see. Marita said, "I'd love information on children with eczema and food allergies slash intolerance." Mm, yeah, and that's a really tough one. Once we get to adulthood, the the connection between food allergies and eczema drops off. It's not that it's not there, but we see that much, much less commonly. And we see stress play a bigger role and we see environmental exposures play a bigger role. But in kids, up to 30% of them can have food related triggers. So it definitely is something to pay attention to. Allergy testing. So if you go to a standard allergist and they do testing on you and you come with a list of positive things, 
those tests, a positive does not mean that, that that food is causing the eczema. And so really still the gold standard is to do a food diary with a food elimination. And it gets tricky in kids because we want them to be growing. We don't want to put them on this like, you know, fish and rice diets for long periods of time because I have seen kids come in really severely malnourished mm -hmm. because the parents were really just doing the best that they could with what they knew at the time to try to kind of figure out what was going on with them. Um, I, so I want to say, if you're going to do that, I usually recommend removing one food at a time, sticking to the big, the kind of big, the common bad actors. Mm -hmm. And those are dairy, um, shellfish, um, eggs, soy, tree nuts. Those are really common ones. Mm -hmm. I have seen some people who have sensitivities to things like tomatoes and like the nightshade is a whole nother thing that you can go down a huge rabbit hole and it's tricky. A lot of it is not very well substantiated, but if somebody comes in telling me that tomatoes flare their eczema, I believe them, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I also want to test it out a little bit because mm -hmm. you know, once people are avoiding all nightshades, that, that eliminates a whole lot of really healthful foods too. And, and certainly we want to be careful with how we approach it and we want to do an elimination. Mm -hmm. When it comes to skin, the elimination period of any of these diets takes a little longer. With GI issues, it's one week, maybe two weeks. But with skin, it can sometimes take a little longer. Mm -hmm. And so I recommend kind of doing one thing at a time and keeping really good track of what the symptoms are. That symptom diary can be really invaluable. And so yeah. sometimes that allergy testing can kind of give you a direction to go. But a lot of times I'll come in, people have this long list of things that they that showed up as positive on their allergy test. And most of them are not clinically relevant. So right. it's kind of just a starting point if that's what somebody's where somebody's on that path. Yeah, I think I think um, I've heard that some allergy tests are more than fifty percent false positives. Yeah. So yeah. Y you it it get, may give you a list of things to try, <laughs> but it right. doesn't mean you're allergic to all the things it says you are. You know. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so that's you take that with definitely a grain of salt, right? And, um, yeah. and sort of work with it. Yeah. Okay, uh, Susan said, what causes tiny red pimples and brown spots on arms? And is there a way to help prevent and treat them nutritionally? And also mm -hmm. what causes thinning crepey skin and how to remedy this? Yeah, yeah. Well, the thin crepey skin we kind of talked about a little bit earlier and really that's protection from the UV radiation, from excessive UV radiation, hydration, you know, and, and eating a really healthy diet will help dampen that, but not take it away. When it comes to the bumps on the arms, I'm not quite sure. There's a lot of things that cause brown spots on the skin, um, including UV exposure. Um, I think she might be talking about a condition that we call keratosis pilaris on the arms. And what we see here is kind of bumpiness on the outside of the arms. And that's almost considered a normal variant. About half the population has it to some mm -hmm. degree. Some people have it much more extensively than others. And we think that this is probably a genetically related thing. Um, there isn't really anything from a nutritional standpoint because they can look red if people are scratching, picking, or using loofah sponges or really being over aggressive with exfoliation, but mm -hmm. it by itself is not an inflammatory condition. So it's, there, there isn't really anything that, that we know from a nutritional standpoint that can address it. You really want to treat the skin gently. And if you're using exfoliators, which can be really helpful, you will just want to make sure you're not overdoing it because that can actually kind of turn on you and make it worse. Mm hmm Got it. Thank you. Um, Michelle said, I've got a couple age spots on my face that I'd love to get rid of. It seemed like they appeared almost overnight as the result of a traumatic event in my life. Is that possible or just coincidental? One, I have mostly faded using topical products, but another two are holding on strong. I'd love to have my clear skin back. Is it still yeah. possible? It is possible to have things kind of show up suddenly, especially after a very stressful period usually not like an incident that's stressful and you recover within a couple of days. But if you're kind of coming out of a long couple of years of stress, you know, that, that can show up. Um, it's hard to know. My guess is if some of her spots have faded with topical lightening agents that she's used from over the counter, and then there's a couple that are hanging on, they might be something called a seborrheic keratosis. And these are kind of spots that come with genetics and time. It sort of is something that as we go through life, as we kind of hit our late thirties, they can start to show up. And some people get a lot, some people get very few, but almost everybody has, you know, at least one or two and they tend not to fade with the topical creams. They, um, you know, my grandma used to call it mold. <laughs> She'd say, I'm, I've lived so long, I'm growing mold. And it's not exactly mold. Well, it doesn't mold at all, but they, they have this 
kind of quality of not being part of the skin is kind of being more stuck onto the skin. They can be yeah. flat, but they can also be raised up and kind of crusty. They, you know, then that would be looking at like a cosmetic procedure to have those removed. Um, from a nutritional standpoint, I have had a few patients swear by like eggplant and I have had three patients that did this after my mom did it. And I was like, well, I don't know. I can't explain this, but, um, but she literally was eating eggplant like three meals a day. And then all of a sudden everything fell off. And I don't know exactly what caused that. And I cannot explain it. I've had, you know, a couple patients who have replicated that and it's just like a huge amount of eggplant. So there might be something in the eggplant that's helpful. One thing that you can do at home, um, uh, you know, if it is a subrate keratosis, and again, I think it's a good idea to get it diagnosed by your, your healthcare provider, whether it's a dermatologist or a primary care. A lot of the times these are so common. A lot of primary care doctors or providers are really aware of these um, is using an over-the-counter wart treatment you know, that can kind of help thin them out. Um, but if you're dealing with ones that are already flat, you're potentially taking on a risk of ending up with a white mark instead of a brown mark. So, you know, those, I'm just kind of throwing out some random things, but again, really it's important to get it diagnosed um, because certainly melanoma is a really scary type of skin cancer and that can show up as a dark brown spot that wouldn't get better with lightning cream. So you kind of, I think, I go check in with your healthcare provider and, and make sure you get a diagnosis and before you kind of... Um, address it from either cosmetic or medical standpoint. Got it. Thank you. And it sounds like uh, if anybody's watching from the Eggplant Growers Association, <laughs> uh, it sounds like you might have a study to do. <laughs> uh, Susan said, loose skin. I've lost a significant amount of weight, over 100 pounds. Is there anything I can do for loose skin short of surgery? Yeah, well, good for you. That's hard to do. And I really applaud you for doing that. Um, a lot of it depends a little bit on your age. So the younger you are, the more likely that skin is to bounce back to some degree. But when I see people who have lost, you know, really large amounts of weight like that, there's a lot of redundancy that's, that is difficult. Um, it matters a little bit when, like if it's a recent loss, you've just lost it and you're kind of sitting there looking at, you know, whatever flabby areas that you're not happy with, give it a little bit of time before you jump right into a surgeon's chair, because um, some of that might improve a little bit? And is it going to be enough to make you feel really happy with where you're at? Maybe and maybe not. So I think, you know, give your body time to adjust. Usually if you're, if you're losing that kind of weight, people don't put weight on super fast. And so your skin has been stretched and stretched and stretched. And so you want to give it time to kind of recover as much as it's going to. That said, as we get older, we lose elasticity and we lose collagen and it does get much harder for our skin to bounce back the same way that it did when we were young. So, you know, I would say give it some time, be a little bit patient. Um, and most likely if, if they're large folds that you're dealing with, then, you know, probably surgery might be the best option. Got it. Thank you. Or consider it a badge of honor to celebrate exactly. your transformation, you know, some exactly. That's, some I love that. Even just better. feel like pride. I know some people who have those extra folds and they think, wow, look at that. That all used to be filled up with mass that I've released and I'm so proud of myself. Mm -hmm. And they, they just learn to love themselves that way too. So that's another that's option really potentially. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Judy said, I have Grover's disease, which is a skin disorder. Do you have any recommendations for treating it? Not sure what causes it. My dermatologist has prescribed medication, but it does nothing for the itching, which can be terrible right. to live with. Yes. Yeah. And Grover's is a tricky one. We don't really understand what causes it or why some people get it. The other name for it is itchy red bump disease. <laughs> Um, because that's what it is. It's itchy red bumps that show up usually on the chest, sometimes on the back, sometimes on the abdomen, and the itching can be really, really significant. What we do know is that it's an inflammatory condition. So anything that you do that can kind of decrease systemic inflammation might help. Um, there have been no studies looking at lifestyle and Grover's disease, um, you know, and and so I can't say that if you go whole foods, plant based, 100 percent, your Grover's will melt away. You know, it might improve and it, it might still kind of stick around. Um, you know, I, I think making sure you're staying well hydrated internally, systemically with water um, and also with moisturizers, high quality, bland, thick creams, ointments or plant based oils. That will help because the most common cause for itchy skin is dry skin. And so if you're dealing with Grover's plus dry skin, that just is a double whammy. Um, and, you know, there, there are a couple of topical botanicals that can be useful. There are some new technologies kind of coming out of the over-the-counter. It still is in the kind of more traditional Western medicine um, uh, armamentarium, but, but there are some new technologies coming about to, 
to decrease itch. I mentioned naltrexone. That's something I've had some luck with topically, helping with a variety of different types of itch. It doesn't work for everything. I can't say that I've tried it with Grover's, um, but you know, um, you might want to think about checking in with um, with either an integrative medicine provider or um, or another a naturopathic doctor. Somebody's going to look at it a little bit differently than than most of us standardly trained uh, dermatologists. I would I would you know, I would try acupuncture if you're open to that. I've seen acupuncture help some conditions, especially when you get to these stubborn conditions that Western medicine is not really good at addressing. Um, and so if you're open to that, acupuncture might be helpful for you. Thank you. Um, Darklene said, I'd like to ask about non-specified dermatitis. I've mm -hmm. been diagnosed with that on my hand and it's taking a long time to heal. I was given something for the itching, but nothing to get rid of it. How mm -hmm. does one get this in the first place and what are natural ways to heal it? Well, it's tricky because with that diagnosis, non-specific dermatitis, I, you know, it's, it's hard to know for sure. I would definitely look at what's in your environment. What are you putting your hands in or what are you putting on your hands on a regular basis? Because if it's just your hands, it very easily could be an irritant or allergic contact dermatitis. So that would be something to con consider. There's also a form of eczema that can happen on the hands called dyshydrotic eczema. People get water blister like lesions that are really, really itchy and you scratch them and scratch them and scratch them. And then they kind of open and drain a clear fluid and then they really burn and are quite painful. Um, with the, with that kind of hand dermatitis, it tends to be very sensitive, um, to a nickel free diet. If you're somebody that's also sensitive to nickel and you'd know that because you might react to a belt buckle or a watch costume jewelry. Um, and, and I have seen people completely clear that and the nickel free diet is not something that's easy to follow, but that's just something that I often consider that type of hand dermatitis is also exquisitely sensitive to stress. So again, kind of looking at what's going on in your life and is this trying to teach you something? You know, I think that's one thing that one of my mentors, uh, help me understand is, is looking at these conditions, these struggles that we have with our health or our, if it's just the skin or other parts of our health as like, what is this trying to teach me? Is it trying to tell me that there's something in my environment that's not good for me? Is it trying to tell me that there's something going on in my life that I need to look at? Um, and especially when I'm dealing with hand dermatitis, you know, for some reason, that's kind of often the canary in the mind when it comes to stress and how we're, how we're, you know, handling it. And again, it's not anybody's fault. Stress is a part of this human experience and, you know, our modern lives are full of stresses. And so it's, it's more about what can we do to make sure that we're responding to stress in an appropriate way from a physiologic standpoint. So that would be something to consider and look at. Again, symptom diaries can be helpful for both of those things. Thank you. I couldn't resist when you said it's often an expression of stress and how we're handling it. I was like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was not intended, but I'm glad I said it that way. <laughs> uh, Linda said, if the skin on your forehead flakes off, and what's that a sign of? I don't mm -hmm. have this issue with any other parts of my body. I use a tray, a spray to treat the symptom, but would like to know the cause. And mm -hmm. are there any ways to reduce rough, bumpy skin on the arms? Well, I, that rough, bumpy skin on the arms, my guess is kind of going back to that keratosis pilaris that I mentioned. There are some creams that have ammonium lactate in it or urea, which is an acid-based cream that might be helpful as kind of a non-physical um, non exfoliate. So that would be something that you could try. Um, and the flakiness on the forehead, it depends a little bit on where it's at. Most of the time that's related to something called seborrheic dermatitis. And basically that's dandruff on the scalp or this flaking on the face, and that's caused by a yeast overgrowth. And again, this yeast is part of our natural microflora. We can't and don't want to get rid of it, but in some people it's happier than in others. It feeds off of dead skin cells, and we tend to see it get worse as people get older. Um, we also tend to see that particularly flare with stress as well. It In the Northern climate, we see more of it in the winter time. It certainly can happen in, in warmer, humid environments, but especially kind of dry forest heat situations, it tends to be happier. So I'd really encourage you to look into the over-the-counter anti-dandruff shampoos. You can use those as a face wash, put it on and leave, you know, leave it on for five minutes and then rinse it off. We don't wanna be leaving shampoos on the skin. Tea tree oil can be helpful for addressing this yeast. So if you're kind of wanting a more natural approach, that's an option. You want to make sure that you are not putting tea tree oil directly on your forehead because that can cause a rip roaring allergic contact dermatitis. And could and you could end up with burns on your forehead if you just 
you know, splash tea tree directly there, but mixing it with something like aloe, which is really soothing, or um, even just plain water, you know, it's a, about 12 drops per tablespoon of whatever vehicle you decide to put it in. You can even put it in, a, in your facial moisturizer or in jojoba oil um, to kind of get down to a 10-ish percent. So when it comes to tea tree oil, we don't ever want to be putting tea tree oil directly on the skin unless we're treating warts or um, or nail fungus, but want it in the less than 20% range. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you. Um, Karen said, I get ringworm quite frequently. What can mm -hmm. I do to prevent this? And secondly, recently I developed a callus on my left ankle. It's strange because I have not changed the shoes and sandals I wear. What might be causing mm -hmm. that? Yeah. Yeah. So the ringworm, um, some people are just more prone to it. And if you've got exposure to animals like horses or dogs or cats, you might want to look at the animals and see if that's a source of it showing up. Um, sulfur is a compound that I love. Not only is it beautiful in its natural state, it's this gorgeous yellow color. And, and you know, sulfur rock is, is really one of the most beautiful rocks um, out there. But sulfur is, is just really good as an overall antimicrobial. And you can get on Amazon, you can just get 10% sulfur ointment, or you can find, you know, five to 10% sulfur bar soaps. Most of those you have to find online. Most of the ones that I see sold in places like Walgreens or um, natural food stores tend to be in the 3% range. And for somebody that's really trying to prevent um, and stave off these fungal infections from showing up, I would re definitely recommend being in that 10% range. It can really dry the skin out. So you want to make sure that you moisturize well after you wash with it, if you choose to use a sulfur um, bar soap. And the other trick to it is you want to leave it on for a good like three to five minutes. So it's not like a soap you put on and just rinse right off. You want to get a little bit of contact time with it, you know, and, and if you actually have ringworm kind of already going, um, the sulfur ointment can help augment if you're using an antifungal medication. And I've had some people even clear just with the sulfur ointment itself. So th those are some tips for that. Um, the second part of the question uh, let's see, was about uh, developing a callus on oh, yes. her left ankle. Yeah. Um, so I would think about maybe you haven't changed shoes, but there might be something that you're doing differently. If you're mm -hmm. meditating and sitting where your your ankle might be rubbing on the floor, if you've got a new meditation cushion or something where you might be putting pressure on that area a little more differently than you were in the past, I would think about that. Uh, another thing that sometimes can happen is we do all kinds of crazy things in our sleep like crazy things in our sleep. And I often will see this and, and it'll be a bed mate that's like, oh yeah, they're constantly rubbing their ankle in their sleep. So that might be where the rubbing is coming from. But mm -hmm. calluses or thickened skin really comes from physical manipulation and that skin is kind of trying to build itself up to protect itself. Less likely, it might be a bone spur or something going on internally that might be putting pressure on the skin from the inside. That's a lot less common, but we do see it with bunions and things like that where you're, usually that also comes with, with, so you might not have changed shoes, but you might be rubbing up against a shoe or boot or something in a different way. Right. Or, or perhaps you're walking differently, which mm -hmm. could be related to your hips or structural mm -hmm. issues. So yeah, probably uh, seeing a podiatrist might be helpful to get them to take a look and see, is your shoe rubbing funny in that spot? Mm -hmm. Funny thing about calluses I've noticed is that once, that once they're there, they create more friction because there's a protrusion in the body, which can then rub up against things. So it can be a bit of a negative feedback loop of sorts sometimes. hundred percent. Absolutely. Uh, last question is from Irene. The skin on my legs from the knees down to my feet is very dry and scaly. I'm wondering how to change this and what might be causing the dryness. Yeah. So dry lower legs is super common, especially as we get older. There is a genetic condition called ichthyosis vulgaris. And that when, when I see extreme dryness in a young person, um, usually there's kind of a plate like scale. So it almost looks like fish scales on the leg. And that usually runs in families. It's an autosomal dominant condition. So if you start asking, people usually have a family history of this same condition. Um, but in as we get older, kind of past middle age, a lot of things start to kind of just break down a little bit. You know, these vessels are kind of like the, we have an expiration date. None of us know what ours is, but they don't last us forever. And so, you know, thinking about how is your blood flowing down to the bottom part of your legs, you know, that can contribute. Um, people sometimes will end up on cholesterol lowering medications and that can really exacerbate dryness. Um, so that's something to consider if you're taking any of those medications, you know, obviously we'd love it if you would get off of them and, you know, kind of treat your cholesterol issues from a diet standpoint, but not everybody can. There are some mm -hmm. just familial conditions that have super high cholesterol and, and your primary care might recommend that you continue that, but that can exacerbate it. Um, generally, if 
I recommend certainly moisturize from the outside in. Make sure you stay really well hydrated. Omega-3 supplementation can be helpful. It's tricky again because we have to balance that omega-6 to omega-3 ratio. And so if you're eating, you know, 30 grams of omega-6 and we throw in two grams of omega-3, you're not going to see much of a difference. Overall, it might, it'll, it'll help you, but it won't be clinically significant. So kind of thinking about where the omega-6s might be seeping into your diet and then, and then maybe considering an omega-3 supplement. Um, I do want to comment that omega-3 supplements taken at super high doses can cause thinning of the blood. And so that's something that you want to watch for. And I generally recommend staying below four grams a day. Um, mm -hmm. As, and that's quite a lot, but that is a lot. Know, for, yeah. for people that are, you know, eating those huge amounts of omega-6, if they want to try to offset that by just continuing to eat the omega-6 and trying to balance the omega-3, you could get into trouble with, with bleeding issues if you, if you go mm -hmm. really high in those omega-3 doses. Got it. Thank you. Apple, you're just a fountain of information and we appreciate so much all your research and your wisdom. It's been a pleasure sharing this time with you and uh, everybody, thanks for tuning in. Yeah, thank you. It's been a joy. When it comes to cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, heart disease, and other chronic illness, what really matters isn't how many books you read, how many webinars you attend, or how much you know. What really matters at the end of the day is what you eat and how you live. The science has given us what we need to know. Now it's time for action. It's time to implement and optimize your healthy lifestyle. It's time to get results. It's time to say goodbye to confusion and hello to clarity. It's time to say goodbye to bad habits and hello to good ones. It's time to fall in love with foods that love you back. It's time to join a community that will support you in achieving your goals. It's time for whole life club.